Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthems of the French Republic and the United States of America.
President, this concludes the honors. Staff, order. Honors. Mr. President, Madam Mitterrand, Mr. Foreign Minister and distinguished guests, Nancy and I are pleased and honored to greet you and Madam Mitterrand. We welcome you as the head of a state who has demonstrated courage and decisiveness in the face of international challenges that test the character of Western leadership. We welcome you also as the representative of the French people for whom all Americans share a special affection. We look out over the White House grounds and we see evidence that the bond between us is deep and has stood the test of time. There in the distance is the Jefferson Memorial, a tribute to America's third president, a founder of our republic, an intellectual whose ideas were profoundly influenced by his exposure to French philosophy and culture. It is not mere coincidence that this giant of American freedom was one of our first representatives to France. Mr. President, millions of people throughout the world admire and respect your country's historic legacy. Today, under your leadership, France continues to be a major contributor to world stability and peace. In this cause, we stand together as two peoples who cherish liberty and two peoples committed to humane and civilized values. Ours is not an easy task. As you have astutely noted, quote, peace like liberty is never given, and the pursuit of both is a continual one. In Lebanon, we Americans are proud that we're part of a peacekeeping force working together at great risk to restore peace and stability to that troubled land. We will always remember that in this gallant humanitarian effort, we stood shoulder to shoulder with your brave countrymen. Our nation's two great world powers have responsibilities far beyond our own borders. Your influence is a force for good in the Middle East. You have drawn a line against aggression in Chad, and you've extended assistance to other African nations seeking to preserve their security and better the lives of their peoples. These are but a few examples of the constructive global rule that France is playing. Mr. President, the American people applaud you and the people of France for your diligence and your courage. President Mitterrand, you come here fresh from a European Community Summit meeting in Brussels. At this meeting and elsewhere, you exerted your leadership as an advocate of greater European unity. I am most eager to discuss with you our bilateral concerns and also those economic, social, and political issues of significance to Europe as a whole. America continues to support a strong and united Europe. The European democracies are, through the North Atlantic Alliance, anchoring the mutual defense of our common freedom. Today, as in years past, our own liberty relies heavily on the goodwill and shared sense of purpose among those people in the world who enjoy freedom. Victor Hugo's words still ring true. It is through fraternity, he said, that liberty is saved. Clearly, Mr. President, if those who love liberty stand together, strong in resolve, freedom will not only survive, it will prevail. Symbolic of our friendship this summer, America will greet the first contingent of French experts coming to New York to aid in the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. This year, we will begin celebrating the centennial of that Lady of Light. 
That magnificent gift, a beacon of liberty for all mankind, is a lasting reminder of that precious heritage that we, the French and American people, share. Mr. President, I am pleased that your visit will include travel to parts of America that, as presidents of France, you have not yet been able to visit. You've already seen a good part of our East Coast, especially the Tidewater section of Virginia, which you visited during the celebration of the French and American Alliance at Yorktown, and again when we met with summit colleagues at Williamsburg. This week, you will go further south to the dynamic city of Atlanta, later north to Pittsburgh. Then you will also journey to America's heartland, the Midwest, the farm country, for a first-hand look at American agriculture. And you will travel to the American West Coast and visit our home state of California. There, innovations in energy and electronics, spurred by tax incentives that reward personal initiative and risk-taking, are paving the road to the 21st century in a new era of high technology. It's comforting to know that no matter what changes technology brings to our way of living, the goodwill between our peoples will remain solid and lasting. America is delighted that you have set this week aside to be with us as a friend. During your visit to Washington, Nancy and I look forward to de deepening our personal relationship with you and Madame Mitterrand and with your colleagues. We offer you a warm welcome and our best wishes for a rewarding and memorable visit. Monsieur le Président, Madame, Mesdames et Messieurs, deux anniversaires encadrent ma visite. Celui des traités de Versailles et de Paris en septembre dernier et celui du débarquement allié en France dans deux mois. On dira le hasard fait bien les choses. J'y vois plutôt une conjonction symbolique. Vous le disiez tout à l'heure, il n'y a pas de hasard dans l'histoire des peuples et seulement des destinées et la nôtre sur tant de points est commune. Aussi ma première pensée va-t-elle vers les Américains et les Français, frères d'armes, qui de Yorktown à Beyrouth ont mêlé leur sang L'histoire montre que ces sacrifices n'ont jamais été vains, car ils n'avaient pas pour objectif la conquête ou la volonté de puissance, mais la défense des libertés. En dépit de tout cela, nos deux peuples ne se connaissent pas assez, ce qui laisse parfois la place à des incertitudes. Après m'être entretenu avec vous, Monsieur le Président, je consacrerai donc cinq à six jours à parcourir votre pays. J'y retrouverai bien des itinéraires que depuis 38 ans j'ai appris à connaître, mais aussi comprendre son dynamisme et sa diversité, sa culture et sa modernité. Mon ambition est aussi de vous présenter, ainsi qu'aux citoyens des États-Unis d'Amérique, oui, au travers de nos propos, au travers de nos conversations qui parleront du monde et de nous, ce qu'est la France, pays de tradition, mais aussi puissance économique et technologique, tournée résolument vers l'avenir, une France qui se prépare avec détermination au monde nouveau que vont apporter les prochaines années. Enfin, une France alliée sûre et constant qui entend apporter une contribution originale à la recherche de la paix et à la poursuite du développement. Poursuite ou reprise. Car les relations franco-américaines 
ne sont pas seulement, chacun en conviendra, la célébration d'un passé glorieux. La préoccupation majeure en 1984 est celle de la sécurité en Europe et des relations entre l'Est et l'Ouest, à quoi il faut ajouter la relation nord-sud dont nous aurons à nous entretenir. Sur ce point, la fermeté et la clarté des orientations que j'ai données à la diplomatie française sont connues de vous-même et de votre administration. Notre fidélité à nos amis est sans faille. Et nous restons nous-mêmes organisé autour de cette notion fondamentale qui s'appelle l'équilibre des forces dans le monde et en Europe. Fermeté et détermination sont indispensables, mais vont de pair avec le maintien du dialogue, et particulièrement du dialogue avec l'Est, parce qu'elle est forte, indépendante et sûre d'elle-même, dans la mesure de ses moyens, qui sont restés fidèles au grand passé que vous évoquiez à l'instant. Sûr de ses citoyens, la France peut et veut s'ouvrir à la discussion avec tous et sur tout. Mais d'autres tâches nous attendent nécessaires à cet équilibre du monde. Certes, la relance de la diplomatie, de l'économie américaine, la présence de sa diplomatie, crée des conditions favorables à des reprises dans tous les sens, tandis que de graves périls continuent de peser sur les systèmes financiers internationaux. Ils ont pu être conjurés, mais ne seront jamais assez. Et pourtant, l'essentiel reste à faire, consolider un acquis encore fragile, faire reculer la misère qui demeure aujourd'hui dans tant de régions du monde la vraie racine de la guerre. Gardons-nous de l'indifférence, elle est notre ennemi. Les pays du Tiers-Monde n'ont pas d'autre univers que celui que leur propose la fin et la peine de vivre. Si ils ont un autre avenir, cela dépend d'eux et de nous. Vous le voyez et vous le savez, et nous en parlerons. Beaucoup de choses restent à faire ensemble. On n'en aura jamais fini. Et notre amitié a peu de chances de rester inactive. Monsieur le Président, Madame, je suis heureux, en effet, devant cette maison et dans cette ville, face à ces lieux qui évoquent pour nous tellement de résonance, de vous rencontrer à nouveau. Nous n'avons jamais cessé d'échanger, de communiquer nos impressions et nos projets. Que ce voyage resserre encore les liens de fraternité entre nos peuples, ce serait la garantie la plus sûre de progrès plus rapides pour atteindre enfin cette région où vit la liberté que nous imaginons et vers laquelle nous sommes en chemin. Comment finir cette première allocution Sinon, en m'adressant à tous ceux qui nous entourent, ici et partout dans ce vaste pays, « On my best greetings to the great American people ». Mr. President, Madam, ladies and gentlemen, my visit today is taking place between two anniversaries, that of the Treaties of Versailles and Paris last September 
and the anniversary of the Allied landings in Normandy in two months' time. Now, one may say that uh, this is uh, perhaps a case where uh, chance has uh, been on our side, but I think that there is more than this. There is something symbolic. And in fact, there is no such thing as, as chance in the history of peoples of the world. There is, however, something that is called destiny. And our destiny is indeed a common destiny. And so I think it is natural that my first thoughts should go to the Americans and the French, brothers in arms, who from York down all the way through the ages to Beirut have in fact shed their blood together. And history shows that these sacrifices have never been made in vain because their purpose was not to conquer nor to achieve power, but to defend freedom. Now, despite all this, perhaps our two peoples do not yet know each other well enough. And so there is sometimes, shall we say, room for certain uncertainties. Now, after having had conversations with yourself, Mr. President, I will and I'll be, I'll have the opportunity of spending five days traveling through the country in order to see again places that I've learned to know in the last 38 years since my first visit to this country, but also to get a better understanding of the dynamic qualities of the country, the great diversity of the United States, its culture and its modernness. But my ambition is also to show you during my visits and during our conversations on world affairs and the affairs that concern our two countries, I want you to see the, the true picture of France. France, which is, all right, a country of tradition, but is also a country of economic and technological power that is looking towards the future. And France that is preparing herself with determination to the, for the world of the future that the next few years are going to bring to us. France, which is a constant ally that can be counted upon and which intends to bring a, her own original contribution to the quest for peace and the pursuit or the resumption of development. Because relations between our two countries obviously cannot only be a matter of celebrating our glorious past. And the, our main concern in 1984 must surely be the question of security in Europe and relations between the East and the West and also between the North and South, which we'll be talking about. And here, the firm and clear orientations that I have given to French diplomacy are known to yourself and to your administration and to our friends throughout the world. And based on the basic idea of uh, unfailing loyalty to our friends and the concept of the balance of forces worldwide and in Europe. Firmness and determination are indispensable qualities, but they must go together with uh, keeping the dialogue open, particularly with the Eastern Bloc. Now, France is strong, independent, and sure of herself, and therefore is uh, willing and prepared and uh, determined to dialogue with everyone on all subjects. And France, sure of her own citizens, is, as I say, open within her means uh, to discussion on all matters while being always loyal to her friends. But there are other important tasks that we have to tackle jointly and which are essential for the balance of the and the equilibrium of the world. Now, it is true, we recognize that the upturn, the economic, uh, the economic circumstances in the United States and the presence of American diplomacy worldwide, all this creates favorable conditions uh, for an, a recovery of world affairs in all sense of the term. And it is true that the serious dangers that were threatening the international financial system last year have been able to be met but our efforts must never be uh, relinquished in such areas. And yet, despite all this that we have achieved, I think the main task is still ahead of us. We must consolidate what has been achieved, which is still fragile. We must push back the frontiers of poverty, which remain in so many regions of the world, the true, the genuine roots of war. 
and we must guard ourselves against too much indifference, any indifference towards the third world in particular. We must remember that the third world is in the same universe, although in difficult conditions, as ourselves.